there was a nurse who had a book stuck to her head and she's in and out you know walking around and she's checking her making her rounds and she's stuck to this book and I said yo I've never saw a person read a book like that so I asked her I said yo what's up what's up with that book and she said you would like this book and I said why you say that and she said because it's about you and your friends I said me and my friends she said yeah thugs I said I ain't no thug she said, well, how come everybody who come to visit you smell like a bunch of weed? And I said, because we all had got cataracts. Welcome to Beyond the Ball Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Beyond the Ball podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones. And as you all know, we, we find really extremely uh, amazing and extraordinary guests. So we're going to get ready to dive in today. Uh, but if this is your first time tuning in to Beyond the Ball, I want to make sure that you all know the focus and the premise of the podcast. The focus ultimately is bringing forward stories, strategies, and successes to help student athletes succeed beyond their degree. So today I'm excited to, to, to bring uh, to Beyond the Ball. Uh, this gentleman, he's a, he's a writer, he's a professor, and he's a television producer. And I know that does not cover it, but welcome to the Beyond the Ball podcast, Mr. D. Watkins. What's, what's going on, D? What's good? How you doing, man? Thanks for having me on. Most definitely, most definitely. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. But now I'm, I'm, I'm gonna kick it over to you, man. Just cause, like, like just like we we're talking before, I'm gonna kick it over to you and give you a chance to, you know, just give the people a snapshot of who you are, especially if this is their first introduction. Yeah. So thank you. Um, teaching is my heart. Like I, I felt like I, I've been an educator since you know I was sitting in classrooms myself. I always had a knack for trying to explain things to people and trying to take really, really dense information and simplify it. And that has led to my writing that has led to, um, and to television now. So right now, um, I'm working with HBO on a project called we own the city that we're actually about to start shooting next month. Um, it's a six part mini series. I wrote episode number three, but I did consult on the whole gig and I'm, I'm extremely, extremely, um, excited about that and um and i also I, I just finished writing carmelo anthony's memoir about maybe two or three months ago and that comes out in in september and i think um i think it's gonna shock the world because you know in preparation i've read a whole lot of basketball memoirs or memoirs by athletes and they all sound the same and i feel like his book is totally different it's gonna knock people out and it's gonna give you like a glimpse into the world um that you never seen before and understand the mentality of a person who was always good at basketball, but didn't really get a chance to focus on basketball. Like a whole lot of athletes, you know, had the luxury because he had to make it out of Baltimore. So, um, but that's me though. I'm just, I'm just a writer and a teacher and a person who likes to share my energy, my money, my resources, and you know, whatever I can do to help, um, strengthen what, 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 what my little writing community have, but at the same time, bring up the next generation of young creatives too, because I think I think it's extremely important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, dang, we can go so many different places with this out, out the gate. You you got my mind just going. Um, but how, how how did you init like what was your initial introduction to, to writing? And, and the reason I'm curious about that is because you know, um, just, just in regards to understanding that this this is a skill set that requires so much of the mind. But then also, you know, just focus and everything like that. So, so take a little bit of time and talk about that, D. So, um, you know, I wasn't like the kind of kid who read a bunch of books when I was coming up. I wasn't really into it. Um, and I had some, some, some bad family situations that led me into the street and, you know, banged me up and all that. And, and when I got a little older and I was trying to clean my life up and I enrolled in college, I had to, um, and I'm, you know, mind you, you know, I'm like 27, 28 years old at this time. And there was a nurse reading who had a book stuck to her head and she's in and out, you know, walking around and she's checking her, making her rounds and she's stuck to this book. And I said, yo, I've never saw a person read a book like that. So I asked her, I said, yo, what's up? What's up with that book? 
And she said, you would like this book. And I said, why you say that? And she said, because it's about you and your friends. I said, me and my friends? She said, yeah, thugs. I said, I ain't no thug. Mm -hmm. She said, well, how come everybody who come to visit you smell like a bunch of weed? And I said, because we all had got cataracts. So she started laughing because she was a funny type. She was a funny type of nurse like that. And I'm silly too. So I fall asleep. She leaves the book by my bedside and it sparked my writing career. <laughs> the book is called the book was called The Coldest Winter Ever by Sister Soldier. And it was a street book that was directly not well, it wasn't, I'm gonna say directly, it wasn't like it wasn't like my life, but it was a familiar language that talked about an experience that I was caught in the middle of for a long time. So I read that book front to back in like a, a day and a half, maybe, which is fast, which was fast for me at the time because I wasn't a reader. It's like now I can read maybe, maybe two, 300 page books in a day. But at this particular time, you know, I wasn't a reader, but I read this book quickly and went on to read every, everything she ever wrote in the middle of Baltimore, all types of wild stuff happened, happened on the block. I'm just sitting outside stuck to a sister soldier book. And then I found out she was inspired by people like Langston Hughes and James Baldwin and Tony Morrison and Zora Neely Hurstie and all of, all of, all of our great ancestors. So I read all of that. And then I read about, well, what was the other people who was more radical or more like wild in their actions at that time writing about. So I ended up reading about the beatniks on the road, neck and lunch, all of these different things. And then I'm like, yo, who inspired them? And I'm reading Fyodor Dostoevsky and 900 page pieces of Russian literature while reading history books too. So I was, that one book just snowballed for me and, and turned into something that I wanted to dedicate my life into. And I, I didn't take it lightly. I, I finished college and then I, um, went, I got into an MFA program and I studied the craft and I've read everything I can get my hands on from the Tim O'Briens to the Juno Diaz's to <laughs> like I've read everything across the board. And, um, and one thing I learned in that journey was I just found out that there's a lot of people who historically have the luxury of telling black stories and you can tell they don't even know any black people. And I took it as a challenge and I always felt like the, the best critique is creation. So I, I started creating and that's, that's kind of how I fell into this game. And here I go five, five books later, um, three out now, like I said, the metal book drops in September. And then my memoir, Black Boy Smile, drops in uh, April of next year. And then uh, with a bunch of other projects on my plate, like I just be turning stuff down now. Uh, <laughs> but but I'm happy. I'm, I'm in a good position. Wow. Wow. So re reading books on the on the stoop in, in Baltimore while everything is going on outside, you said. Man, addicts beating each other in the face and police officers rushing and, you know, a house could have been on fire next to me. I'm, I got to get to the end of the book. Man, <laughs> man, man, man. Wow. 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 So did, did you ever did you ever feel like did, did, you, did you ever feel like you would get to this point where you're at now where you're looking to, you know, create that impact for others through being a professor? Was this something that you had a desire for as you began to read more or? How did this even come about? So when I started reading a lot, I wanted to be a professor, but I wanted to get other young people excited about reading and telling their own stories. Like that's what I that's what I really, really, really had, had my heart set on. I didn't know I was gonna be a New York Times bestseller author. I didn't know that HBO and these different places would be hitting me up and like asking me to like work on television shows and stuff like that like I, I didn't know I didn't know that wasn't really in my plans I I did want to put a book out and I wanted to spend my life being a professor like a nice simple life life in Baltimore but you know them first two books had just took me all around the world and things started changing for me man yeah a New York Times bestseller when, when when you when you first got that call, when you first got the even what just just talk about that that feeling because this is something that's you know bucket list monumental and very 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 a very select few of people have the opportunity to, to to be that. So talk talk a little bit about that. Like what was what was that feeling? Take us back. Um, I, I was in San Francisco, um, doing um 
some work with this with this this amazing company called Collective Impact. They service the three percent black population in um in, in San Francisco. And my agent, my agent called me up and was like, "Congratulations, you are on the list." And I was like, "The list for what?" And then she was like, "New York Times bestseller." And I threw up, but I didn't throw up because of what she said. I threw up because I had walking pneumonia. <laughs> And I, I didn't, I got, you know, I was found myself getting sick on my way down there, but I was going to do my events and, you know, this is like before the COVID scare and all of this stuff. This is like way back in 2016. So, you know, 2016, if you feel like you're getting a cold, you're going to work. And then plus I already took a deposit. So, so, um, you know, I, you know, then I came to myself and I asked her, was she sure? Was she bullshitting? And then she was like, um, Nah, she sent me the link, and um, when I looked at the link, I, I found out I had um, I was dead. Like it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was mind blowing for me. And I think it was difficult because I, I when I came when I got that that book deal, the publishing company didn't have a lot of faith in my project. It took me two years to get a book deal, but then I I wrote I released two books in seven months, and they both hit the list. Okay, so let's rewind back a little, a little, a little bit, a little bit, because cause you said, because you said you finally got the book deal. Le- leading up to that, right? Like what? Because I know there's a lot of people out there, you know, that might be in a space to where either they want to write, they're 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 passionate about writing, but just you know the old adage or, or the old phrase that that we've seen that you know artists or creatives, don't, creatives can't make no money. D, creatives can't make no money. Writers can't make no money, so just just, talk, just just walk walk a little bit back in the journey there, um, before before you got the book deal and what like what emotions you were going through with that. Um, you know, I never I never really believed that, as far as like you know, writers don't make money. I mean, I heard people say that, and I you know I heard a lot of like television people make jokes about it and things like that. But you know, from my early days, like I said, I've been in the street the most of my life and. All of my lessons, all of my resiliency, all of you know my ideas, the ability for me to be able to dream outside of the reality I was in came from the experiences of the people that I bumped into on the blocks. Um, Dauphin told me when I was a little kid, he said, sure, you can make money doing anything if you're good at it. You know, he was talking about plumbing or something like that. And I was like, yo, plumbers make money. He was like, you can make money doing anything if you're good at it. And that stuck with me, you know. So he told me that as a child and it stuck with me. So, um, you know, the the book deal part is you know it's difficult because a lot of people don't really you know this industry is not what a lot of people think it is. Like it took me like a year or more to get an agent. I sent query letters to over five hundred people trying to find representation, and maybe only like ten would take a phone call. And out of that ten, a smaller number was willing to work with me. So like, and that that took time. I think a lot of times the internet just make people think that platform and that success, you know, success just is instant, but you know, success is like a overnight success takes 10 years and there's nothing wrong with that because if you love what you do and you create the content that makes you happy then you just do it. My, one of my homies just told me the other day that he was on a team at Under Armour who denied Jerry Lorenzo, a fair God. You know, he told Jerry Lorenzo, um, yeah, we ain't really feeling any designs like that. And Jerry Lorenzo is bigger than Under Armour's whole sports division now. And they once told him no. So, like, you just got to trust your journey and your path and just stay loyal and, and keep the faith and, 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 and work hard. Mm, man. Yeah, that's real. That's, that's, man, that's real. That's real. So now I, I, I want to I hear a little bit from you just in regards to we speak for ourselves, right? When, <laughs> What what made you say that it was the time to to put this project out? What made you say the people need to know and the people got to understand that we we speak for ourselves? You know, it's, it came from um, I was watching um, the news back when um, those white boys had that that racist rally up in Charleston, not Charleston, up in Charlottesville, Charlottesville, Virginia, where the white boys with the tiki torches was doing a march and all that. And I saw a black commentator on TV crying. Um, and I was like, yo, what is wrong with him? Like, 
he's crying like I can't believe this is happening in America. And I'm like, dog, where you been at? Like, <laughs> like where you been at? Um, you know, this is a very racist country, and it, it you know, and it, it works really hard to show you at least twice a month on a viral tip. So um, I thought about how at the time I was also being invited to, to do commentary on, a, on like CNN and MSNBC a lot. And I never really liked it as much because I just don't feel like I'm the Negro expert or the, or the black the expert or the street guy expert. Like I'm just figuring this stuff out like everybody else. But when I come on these shows, the commentators or the producers or whoever, they assume that I'm speaking for every black person in the world. And like, I, I don't know your life. I don't know your experience. You might, you know, you might love a certain type of whatever that I don't really bang with. It doesn't make me more black or you more black or whatever. It's our experiences is rich and, and complex as any other racial ethnic group in this country. So why, how come we always have to be pigeonholed? And I was frustrated. I was frustrated with that. Like, you know, I had people talking about oh, the black people want this, black people want that, black people want this. And I'm like, yo, well, who asked you? I never asked you. I, know, I don't want these things you're talking about, but I'm supposed to subscribe to that because that's the, the narrative that mainstream wants to put out. So I wrote that book and that book was, it was like, it was counter mainstream and it, it didn't really get, it didn't really get a lot of press because a lot of people were, they were upset with that. I was cool with that too, though. So I'm, so I'm gonna ask you an answer that I'm gonna ask you a question. I already know the answer to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you, even though I know you're not the black expert, neither am I. We having a conversation, but but why is that, D. Watkins? That when that that when we put out something that should be celebrated, or we put out something that's going to uh, spark a movement or really move the masses, it, it it doesn't get the traction. But when we put out something on Shade Room or whatever it might be, then then it goes super viral. Talk talk to me. Talk to me. People like violence. <laughs> they like the drama. They 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 like violence. Uh, you know, I think I think there is I think there's a space for good content and, and good ideas. And I, you know, I, I try not to be the person who acts like good doesn't exist. You know, I, I'm I'm extremely optimistic, and I, I I do believe in us. But I'm also going to challenge us. Like I'm gonna challenge anybody else. I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge us. Like I'm gonna challenge anybody else because I want us to be the best. Fair enough. Fair enough. And then with you with, with, with you really saying that, that really just sparks uh, sparks this question I was thinking about um, with, with with you wanting us to be the best, and then you also being the you know be, being the founder of the the Be More Writers Project. Can can you just educate the people a little bit about about the Be More uh, the Be More Writers Project? Yeah, so like I, when I when I started it, it a lot of people like they they thought it was going to be an ongoing thing, and it was just me and like about about six different students, and those students um, I got them paid to tell stories about their community and present them at Johns Hopkins University, and it was a it was it was it was a, it was a solid project. I had I had a lot of fun with it. Um, the whole purpose was for young people to have stake and articulating and telling the story of themselves in their neighborhoods through video, through audio, and through writing, and to actually get paid for it. So we were set to launch again, but then COVID happened. But we're making another plan to start with another group of freshmen and work with them from ninth grade to when they graduate. And, you know, I think it's, I, 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 th I thought it was a cool thing. We had a lot of fun. Yeah, man, most definitely. I, I believe anytime we can, you know, seed into the next generation and position them with the, you know, give, giving them an outlet or even giving them a tool that, that they can use to leverage, I think that's always a great thing. A great thing. As an artist, it's a, it's a part of your body of work. Like, you can have these beautiful books and these beautiful films and all of that, but if you ain't help, helping nobody come up or putting nobody on, then, you you know, then you, you, you're, not complete, you're not fully doing your job. Most, most definitely, most definitely. So now, you know, as 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 you're you're coming you're com coming into the coming into the time to where, um, just like you said, the the release of Carmelo Anthony's memoirs. What 
what was it like work working with Melo? Just just talk 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 a little bit about a little bit about that, D. Um, so one day my agent had, um hit me up and was like, "Are you interested in writing memoirs for other people?" And I'm like, "I mean, yes or no? Maybe it depends on who it is." Because I said no to that a lot of times. And she said it's Melo, and I'm like, "Oh wow!" Like I remember um watching Melo play ball in high school and matching up with him. Um, when he was coming up, I'm a little older than him, but um, Baltimore has a big basketball community, and we we go to war. So the fact that he was in New York, well, he was he was in New York at the time, but he was um, he was living in New York, and I think he was just leaving OKC. But this is before he signed with Portland, and I'm in Baltimore, but my writing is taking me all of these different places that our agents linked us, not our mutual friends, and not like a con- not us, you know passing at an event or something, but our agents had messed up was just crazy, and um, I was wanted to have a talk with him, because I, you know, I said, we're going to do this, you know, I want to I want to tell a whole story, I don't want to write anything colorful, and you know, well, colorful, yes, but I don't want to write anything pretty, I want to, you know, I want to talk about that ugly, and he was like, nah, that's, that's, you know, that's, t- they told me that's why they came for you, and they was like, you know, they had some other people lined up, but if I say yeah, then the job is mine, so I was like, alright, bet, let's do it, and we got to it, and we had fun with it. Like we didn't get to hang out as much because of COVID, but we got a chance to just get on Zoom and just crack jokes and tell stories and crack jokes and tell stories. And then we had maybe like out of ten Zoom calls, maybe only one of them was like, uh, "All right, bet we're gonna do this, this, and that." <laughs> and and then it was smooth. You look up, and I got like seventy thousand words done. Man, wow, seventy thousand words! <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> oh golly golly wow 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 we own the city we we, we own the city see you see and and and, and this, this this is the place i was at when we first kicked this thing off d watkins i was like man there, there's so many different ways to go with this thing there's so many different questions i, I want to ask you but man you, you you already on the new york times bestseller list multiple times you know you getting ready you you're now you know, also getting ready to put put out the memoirs with, with Melo and you working with HBO. We we own the city. We own the city. What what are you wanting people to take away from watching and seeing your work with We Own the City? I think I want people to see that poor policing is incentivized. So when these cops come in and they turn neighborhoods apart. And we hear a story about, oh, a few bad apples. We know it's, it's more than a few bad apples. It's a bad system, and it's a system that rewards you for not doing what you're supposed to do. You know, I'm on my whole abolish the police tip, throw them away. But if I'm going to talk about the system as it is, and so let's say somebody get killed, and you got a cop investigating the murder, and it's so much work for him, so much canvassing, so many people to talk to, so much footage to watch, so many things you got to figure out before you can, like, pin a person down or get a snitch or, like, you know, figure out who did this murder. That can take, like, six months of work, and they're not giving you no overtime, but you solved the murder. Now, if you lock up 30 people a month, and you locking them up and riding their bike on the curb, public urination, jaywalking, or or whatever, you know, then you, you know, the one cop who, fa- who found out who killed somebody, he got one court fee, he got one arrest in six months. The cop who locked up 30 people, he got 30 court fees, 30 processing fees, and he's looking like a hero, even though he's locking up a bunch of quality of life crimes that ain't never gonna go nowhere anyway. You just ruining lives and locking people up for nothing and dragging people through the system, but you get to look like you tough on crime. So you're incentivized for doing work that doesn't matter more than doing work that actually does. And hopefully we'll be able to show that. I'm excited about this project because you know it's the David Simon project. He did the wire and you know for people who love the wire and, and the wire ain't coming back. So this is like the closest thing to the wire 
that people are going to get. And I, I get to work on it. When Hawaii came out, I was in the streets. I was hustling. I wasn't even watching HBO like that. Like, so to be working on a project now that he's back is just like, it's, it's crazy for me. Man. Yeah. 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 So if, so if you had the opportunity to sit, sit down, D Watkins, had the opportunity to sit down with, I'm, I'm going to give you two people. You can sit down with two people, living or dead, right? Just to sit down with these people, just to talk with them, just to build with them. Who who would those two people be for you? Um, dead, I would like to sit down with my grandma, just to let her know how far I came, and then I made it about them situations that she prayed about. Living, that's a good question. That's a good question. I don't even know what living person I would want to sit down with. I have no, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> Cause I just treat everybody the same. Like I treat everybody like they Jesus. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So like, I, you know, if you could be a billionaire and you can be in the street. Um, if we here, I'm in this moment, I'm giving my attention, I'm learning and listening, I'm sharing, I'm building the community. That's real. That, that that's 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 real. Fair enough. Fair enough. But we're we're, we're about to we're about to dive into the two minute drill. But real quick, D Watkins, just just let people know where they can find you, how they can follow you, and how they can connect with you. Um, at D Watkins World on all social media platforms. Um, and if you're on Baltimore, I just be walking down the street. Like I just be out of my business. You just holler at me. You know, it's all good. Oh man. Right on, right on. If, I, if, I, if I'm ever in Baltimore, I'm going to I'm gonna have to hit you up. I'm gonna have to hit, yeah, you hit up. me up. Hit me up. If I'm home, I'll give you the tour for sure. Oh, man. That, that's, man, that's love. That's love. That's love. Okay. So, so D. Watkins, I didn't, I didn't tell you this before we dive in, but, but now I'm about to dive into something called the, the two-minute drill. And, and, and what the two-minute drill is, I'm going to run through some rapid-fire questions just to, you know, just show the people a different side of you. We're going to have a, have a little bit of fun. So, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Here we go. Favorite food? Graham crackers. Mm, okay. Honey graham crackers, though. Cinnamon's trash. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's the last book you read? The last book I read was actually right in front of me. It's uh, How to Survive by D.L. Hughley. I just interviewed him today. Oh, wow. That's dope. I'm looking forward to that. What's your, what's your favorite podcast? My favorite podcast is Revisionist History, um, that Malcolm Gladwell joint. Okay, okay. What's your What's your go to streaming show of preference? My go to streaming show of preference. That's a good question. So does it have to be like on Hulu or like um, Netflix or something? Yeah, you 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 call it. You call it. All right, so I'm 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 gonna go with that Wu Tang joint, man. I watched that. I watched that twice. And I don't even had the time to watch a whole series twice, but I watched it twice. Like I thought it was fire. Okay, okay. What what's the most underrated cereal? The most underrated cereal to me, multi grain Cheerios. Mm. Like everybody talking about the honey nut, and then like them widows and cereal killers like regular Cheerios. Like I don't like my wife eat regular Cheerios, and I just don't understand. Like I don't understand it. Like she eat them. Like she, like she walks towards them in the store, and it's the like this most strangest thing. I almost was gonna get out the marriage because of that. <laughs> but the Monty Graham was are surprisingly better than Honey Nut. Oh man! And then what's what's one tip that that, that you want to leave for for a student athlete? What's one tip for for a student athlete? I would say let sports take you as far as it can take you, but don't let it stop you from understanding the other passions and dreams that you have. Because a lot of times, most pro athletes, or athletes in general, their careers are over in their 20s. And you wanna have way more life. And you wanna fill that life with something meaningful. So find out what else you love and what else you care about on top of sports, or even if it's sports related, and pour your heart in that too. And you'll find a whole lot of happiness. That's real. That's real. And then, the, and then the bonus question: We we made it through the two minute drill. Bonus question: Who who's one guest you'd like to see me interview next on Beyond the Ball? I would love to see you interview Don Cheadle. 
you know, I think Don Cheese was hilarious. I think he's super talented actor, super talented brother, um, and we have a whole lot of gems and a whole lot of game. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I, hey, I, I would shoot a DM and I would shoot my shot. Cause I, was just watching, <laughs> I was watching him the other day on Iron Man. So, word. Yeah, word. yeah, yeah. Mo, mo, most definitely, most definitely. But one more time. One more time, D. Watkins. Where where can people find you and how they can follow you and stay connected with you? Everywhere I'm at, at D. Watkins World on all social medias. I ain't got no TikTok and all like that, but I'm on I'm on Instagram and Twitter mostly. I got a Facebook, but I don't really know how to work Facebook. Fair enough. It's got too many options and feel like it'll be something on there on Tuesday, and then I'll close it and open it like a month later, and it'll be like the same thing. I'll be like, yo, what? Like the timeline don't change? It's super weird. That's true. I'm, I'm laughing so hard because that's so true. Because I'm, I'm like, why? Yo, it's like, I don't get it. I think you got to, like, maybe pay. I think you got to talk to people for it to move. But I just, I don't know. I don't, you know, I write a lot. So I don't have a lot of, you know, time to talk. Oh, man. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, well D. Watkins, man, I appreciate you taking the time uh, to, to hop on. And, man, de- definitely looking forward to continue to build. And, and, my brother, I wish you much, much, much success. Absolutely, man. I appreciate it. To all the ballers out there, all the ballers out there, you all just just tapped in and heard a, a heard another uh, dope episode of Beyond the Ball. Make sure, make sure you're on the lookout for We Own the City when it when it drops on HBO, and then also make sure to tap in to to, to D Watkins on, at D Watkins World on Twitter and Instagram and and, and stay up to date with with everything uh, that he's doing and, and everything that that he's moving. Um, so, uh, everybody, so I would encourage you to subscribe to the podcast and definitely